We made it to the last video. Well done. Now we can look at three-dimensional systems and their band diagrams and start to make some sense of them. And we're going to do that here and then interpret those diagrams for the behavior of metals and semiconductors. We'll talk about indirect and direct gap semiconductors, which is something that a simple box picture of a band diagram cannot possibly tell us. And then we'll discuss the applications of those indirect and direct systems, because they're very different in terms of their light absorption properties. We'll see some are suited for lasers and LEDs, and others for photovoltaics. So enjoy this last one, and thanks for staying with all eight. Good luck. Well, I think now we can just start to interpret band diagrams for 3D systems. The principles are identical to that that we've covered for the 2D system. It's just we've got another vector. We've got kx, ky, and kz, and things can get tricky. Tricky not only to calculate, but also to visualize. Let's just make some key points. Now my gamma point, all of that means is along every primary direction, x and y, and now z, there are no sign changes in the atomic orbitals. That's the crystal orbital that's formed. Zero, zero, zero. But there's more special high symmetry points, right? For our 2D system, we just looked along going along an edge of the square and along a diagonal. As soon as I get to, for example, a cubic system, now a key direction is what's going on with the crystal orbitals as I go along that body diagonal of the cube from the gamma point to the so-called L point. Hopefully we could say what the L point is, because we know with all of these letters they're corresponding to where at least one of my vectors, one of my direct k vectors, is pi over a. At the L point, they're all equal to pi over a. The signs of the atomic orbitals are alternating, plus minus, plus minus, along x, along y, and along z. And so now we'll go back to what I showed at the very beginning of this whole series of videos on bonds to bands. Let's go back to some of those examples of 3D band diagrams to see if we can make a little bit more sense of them. So here's the band diagram for aluminum metal. Now we know what some of these points mean. Let's not worry about some of the letters that we haven't seen. They're just different directions. And they're going to get more complicated, of course, if the system isn't cubic, if it's hexagonal or other lower symmetries, things get tricky. Here are my spaghettis hanging on the uh, K points. Immediately we see there's no gaps. Multiple bands are crossing each other all over the place. We can start to see some bands are running downhill, some bands are running uphill. Maybe we could go into more detail and think about whether those are S-derived or P-derived or whatever. We won't do that here. The main point is if I see a diagram like this, and typically the Fermi level is shown on it, here at 0 EV as it turns out, I can tell straight away that's a metal, there's no gap. And there's my corresponding box picture. Contrast that then to semiconductors. Here's the band diagram for silicon. If we look at this, we can see the bands don't all overlap, they're not all crossing with each other. And there is a gap between the top of this green band, which is the so-called valence band, and the bottom of the blue bands, which are actually the conduction bands. And in silicon, all of the greens are filled, and the blues are empty. And to conduct, I've got to jump the gap. So just as I look at this band diagram, I look at my spaghetti, this, the green and the blue spaghetti has a gap between it, an energy gap. And here's my box picture. It's a semiconductor. Let's turn to another issue which turns out to be very important. That is the issue of whether a band gap is direct or indirect. So here I'm comparing two well-known semiconductors, silicon we've all heard of, gallium arsenide perhaps also. Now let's just look at the blue and the green spaghetti for both of them. They kind of look the same, right? So there's clearly a gap in the band diagram for gallium arsenide, and there's a gap in the band diagram for silicon. Let's not worry about the magnitude of the gap. They're a little bit different. Here's my two box pictures. This box representation says, okay, 
They're semiconductors, maybe there's a slight difference in the band gap, but that's it, other than that, they're the same. But the band diagrams of all the crystal orbitals show that they're not. And specifically, what's important here is the value of the K vector for the valence band maximum and for the conduction band minimum. The crystal orbitals at the top of the valence band, here they're at the gamma point, and those at the bottom of the conduction band, which are not at the gamma point, they're at a different value of the K vector. And because the K vector, which is related to momentum, because the K vector is different, then if an electron is to be excited from the valence band to that conduction band, it has to change its momentum. It has to change its K value. That has important consequences for light absorption. And let's just highlight that difference in the K values of those crystal orbitals at the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band. Now for gallium arsenide, things are different. Here's the top of the valence band. Here's the lowest energy conduction band crystal orbital. Let's highlight them. They are at the same K vector. They both actually occur at the gamma point, the Kx, Ky, Kz equals 0, 0, 0. There's no change in momentum when I excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. So the difference between a direct and indirect band gap is very important. And as I mentioned a few seconds ago, it has huge implications for light absorption and emission. When light, photons, excite an electron, two things must be conserved. Energy, obviously the energy to promote the electron to a higher energy level is coming from the energy of the photon. So that must be conserved. But also momentum must be conserved. And that's the so-called Frank Condon principle that you may see in physical chemistry and spectroscopy. So I've got to conserve both. Now let's look at a case where I have a direct band gap material. And I've drawn a schematic of the band diagram here on the right. So the valence band maximum and the conduction band minimum are aligned at the same K vector. And therefore, when a photon excites an electron into the higher level, I conserve energy, but I also conserve momentum through the light absorption. So the energy of the photon is equal to the energy difference of the gap, and there is no change in the momentum of the electron because the difference of the momentum, the K vector in the valence band and conduction band, there isn't a difference, it's zero. And so this process, light absorption, and also the reverse, light emission, occurs with high efficiency. But now let's look at an indirect band gap material. With an indirect band gap, the K vectors of the electron before and after excitation are not aligned. It has to, in this case, the way I draw it, is going to have to increase momentum. And so the excited electron must gain or lose momentum. And how is it going to do that? The problem with photons is they have no mass and they carry very, very weak momentum. So there's no momentum in the photon to be lost or gained. And so I'm going to have to find another particle, something else from which I can gain or lose momentum. And that's a lattice vibration. That's the vibrations of the lattice. They do carry momentum. And those are so-called phonons. And so in this case, to excite the electron, I can get the change in energy from the photon, but to get to the right final momentum, I must interact through gain or loss with that lattice vibration. And so this requires that I have an interaction between three separate entities, the electron in the crystal orbitals, the photon, the light, but also the lattice vibration, the phonon because I cannot do this directly just through light because of that conservation of momentum principle. Anytime you want interaction between three entities, that's going to be much lower probability. And so this is a very weak optical transition. The chances of having it happen are far lower than they are for a direct semiconductor. Direct and indirect band gap materials have quite different properties and very different applications. Direct band gap materials, they're highly absorbing. They make excellent light absorbing and emitting devices. So they're used in LEDs and in lasers. 
is a classic Pink Floyd concert. It lasers all over the place. And examples are gallium arsenide, enium arsenide, others are listed. But also amorphous silicon, where I don't have a periodic lattice. That's actually a direct band gap material. Indirect band gap materials, crystalline silicon, crystalline germanium, they are poor light absorbing, poor emitting properties. They are really no good for light generating applications. Well, well, hang on a minute, though. You're saying, I know, perhaps, that in solar cells, silicon is the most widely used photovoltaic material. And a photovoltaic requires light absorption and excitation of an electron to get a voltage. And yet here you're saying it's kind of rubbish. Well, no, I didn't say it was rubbish. I just said it's a much lower probability of light absorption. And so actually for a silicon-based device that's harnessing light somehow in its application, then I'm going to waste a lot of the light to get what I want, and so I have to use much thicker layers to absorb an equivalent amount of light as an indirect band gap material. For example, one micron of gallium arsenide absorbs an equivalent amount of light as hundreds of microns of silicon. So why don't we just use gallium arsenide instead of silicon in a solar cell? Well, there is a trade-off. Even though silicon might be a bit crappy in absorbing the light, uh, the thing about the direct semiconductors like gallium arsenide, it might be easy to excite the carriers, but it's also very easy for them to just drop back and, and emit the light. So light in, light out, and I don't get any way. That re recombination process is also more efficient. And for a photovoltaic, when I excite the electrons, I want to use them. I don't want them just to recombine and go back down in energy. I want to put them through a circuit. So the efficiency of the recombination is lower for silicon, and, and that's an advantage. But the bottom line, to be honest, is dollars. Why is silicon so widely used? Why am I using something where I have to have much more material, much thicker layers? It's because it's a heck of a lot cheaper. It's widely available. It's a sustainable material and therefore I'll put up with that extra amount of silicon that I need to get the corresponding performance.